Hey, um, my name is Emily Bass. I'm the program director of AVAC. I'm going to be um, getting out of the way very quickly and allowing the other women on the podium to speak. The topic of this press conference and of the demonstration that you just saw outside um, is women claiming and shaping some of the news that has been most striking at this conference with regards to ARV-based prevention. Um, and claiming it in the name of a women's HIV prevention revolution. And as you will hear, the speakers today are going to explain that this is not a biomedical revolution, this is not a revolution of science alone, it is also a revolution of rights, and that rights cannot be overlooked. I'm going to ask each speaker to make just a couple of quick remarks and then open it for questions, and I'm going to start with Louise Binder of the International Community of Women Living with HIV and AIDS. Uh, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. I don't know. <laughs> I'm from Canada. <laughs> it's morning there. Um, I uh, am a woman living with HIV and AIDS, and I have been for approximately 25 years. Uh, I've been diagnosed for 17 of those 25 years, and uh, I have uh, spent my volunteer time since then uh, doing work for people with HIV to access treatments, and particularly to uh, bringing the issues of women and HIV uh, to the fore around the world. So we're going to hear in a few moments about the amazing advances in technology that ha have been announced at this conference that could have such a profound effect on this epidemic and on the lives of women and girls. And in fact, it could really be the beginning of the end, which is what we have all hoped for for so long. However, without women's ability to access these technologies and to have sexual rights, not just reproductive rights, but sexual rights, these technologies will be nothing more than nice exhibits for a museum, the museum of a dying sex, the sex of women, including young girls. We must sound the alarm against religious, cultural, political, and scientific leaders who do not support the sexual rights of women. And it's really ironic that we're holding this conference at this time in a country and in a city where we find one of the strongest opponents to the sexual rights of women and also one of the most important religious figures in the Christian religion, and that is the Pope, the Vatican, the Holy See. Only six weeks ago, at the United Nations High Level Meeting, the Holy See spoke against, against the sexual rights of women loudly and clearly. Joined by the United States, and a group of African countries with Egypt as one of their spokespeople, they, um, the Holy See and their allies succeeded in withholding these sexual rights from women and girls by opposing language in the Declaration of Commitment on HIV and AIDS. Clearly, the Pope is withholding his blessing for sexual rights for women and girls that could save millions of lives. Prevention technologies, however excellent, are only as good as the access to use them and the ability to control their use. Women do not have this access or these controls globally. We need religious leaders of all religions, cultural leaders in all communities, political leaders in all countries and at all levels. And we need researchers to speak out for sexual rights for women. Because as we've said so many times before in so many different settings, silence equals death, the death of millions of women and girls. And silence also equals complicity in the mass murder of these women. So to the Pope and to all those with powerful voices, we demand that they speak out for women's and girls' sexual rights. Thank you. Our next speakers 
Dr. Elizabeth Bakusi is from the Kenya Medical Research Institute, and she's going to give some of the context for some of the uh, new strategies that women, including the women sitting here on the podium and in the front rows, are naming as part of the prevention revolution. Thank you very much, Emily. I apologize that my voice is a little hoarse, but I must admit that this meeting really gives us a lot of hope. As has been said, my name is Elizabeth Bukusi. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and I'm passionate about women and I don't apologize for it at all. I believe that women must have a voice, women must have options. And I think it's really exciting that at this meeting, it's very clear and the science is showing it that there is hope, that there are options that women can have access to and use to make their choices about protecting themselves and ensuring that they don't get HIV. And so as a scientist, I really do want to say that the science is clear. We do have evidence that pre-exposure prophylaxis can protect women from acquiring HIV. We also know from results that we released last year that the Denofovir gel, the 1% gel, can protect women and prevent them from getting HIV. So the science is out. There is information. And I think we need to ensure that we know how we can translate the findings of this science into practical ways <coughs> that can make it possible for women to access these products, make choices about their sexuality, and protect themselves. Thank you. Sylvia Petretti is a hometown girl and um, um, a member of We Care Women in Europe and Central Asia pro uh, group of women living with HIV. Uh, I was born in Rome and I grew up here and I am a woman living with HIV. I think I paid, uh, in my own life, I paid the consequences of growing up in a Catholic country, in a country where sexuality and the rights of women are very often uh, overlooked. As a as somebody who acquired HIV in my early 20s, I know fully well how a, a prevention revolution like the one that is happening now might, would have changed my life, would have probably saved my life in many ways. What it is more appalling, when I got diagnosed here in Rome in 1997, was that uh, my prevention needs, even there, were still denied. In the clinics where I was going, there were no condoms available. There was no, not once, not once a discussion about how I was feeling in respect of the sexual relation, in respect of how I could protect my partner from acquiring HIV. We, we as women living with HIV, we had prevention needs as well. So I feel very, very strongly that these uh, discoveries will give us the choice to protect our partner to protect our families and live a sexuality which is uh, pleasurable and, and safe. So, thank you very much for listening. No strategy can be implemented, no biomedical strategy, and indeed no strategy can be implemented without thinking about resources, human, technical, financial, um, Marley Zatoban is a young AIDS activist from the new country of southern Sudan and <laughs> and an HIV prevention officer in the Ministry of Health there and is, and is better positioned than anyone I know to talk about the resource context for thinking about this revolution. Uh, once again, my name is Mary Lee uh, I come from southern Sudan. I was born HIV positive and told my status when I was 16 years. So I'm um, here I'm going to talk about two things that for me I see in my country is happening, especially in the uh, health sectors. First, the, if they could promote the health sectors, especially the VCT and the PMCT, uh, the, like to promote in the VCTs is the first. Uh, 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 let me say it's the first point where uh, someone can go in and uh, get the first tested and if it was empowered, I think uh, things uh, HIV there, 
let me say, in promoting the treatment of uh, people living with HIV as they, they move from the VCT to the RRT. Sometimes you find in the RRT as they, the, uh, they, they should put the, let me say, the, the people who are infected with HIV in the drugs earlier. They, uh, here, because we, they first must test the, uh, let me say, the CD4. And in my country, the CD4 count, let me say, in a month, sometimes it works twice. And uh, so, testing someone to put in, the, uh, there's no other diagnosis here. As you are, like uh, the viral load isn't there, someone takes uh, ARVs for a long time. And secondly, if you take the ARV for a long time, you know, there are also side effects. And uh, at least they, they have to shift you earlier to the second line treatment. From there, if you go to the PMCT, you know, we have women as women and young girls. We have rights for our the sexual rights to have our own children, to be also a mother, to marry. So if you get pregnant, you enter in the PMCT program, here, there is this uh, problem here also, where right, the mother should be given uh, the nevara pain, uh, the fallout for the baby. So here, the process is not that smooth. The fallout is not there. So the risk for the baby having uh, infected is too high. That's uh, secondly. Then uh, poverty <coughs> for us young girls and women. You know, uh, we are so vulnerable. If I don't have bread in the house, I'll be forced at least to look for something for my children to eat. In this case, uh, I'm forced to go and do something else to at least feed the family. So in this case, I think also poverty leads to HIV infection. Then secondly, as young girls, sometimes, you know, uh, you don't have everything and uh, the parents have died. Uh, you, you, you like the breadwinner. There is what we call an our family sugar daddies. You think he's going to help you up, so you have to give in and so that uh, you get something to make the others at least grow up. I think I can stop here. Thanks. Very much, Marilisa. Before I introduce our next speaker and then we're going to move on to questions, I do want to um, recognize Dr. Julio Montanar and Mi Aids, who have both recognized this issue as being important and, and have brought their bodies and put them on the line, which is the best way we know how. We're delighted that this room, uh, this dais, is all women. We noticed that the ARV based prevention results, although they were powerful women investigators by side in several of those trials, um, did have all men, and we want to change the face of uh, the experts on this, as well as recognizing the scientists, several of whom are here as well.